Plus, great. We've got two pieces of breaking news at this uh, panel. I don't even think Geraldo can do that one. <laughs> All right, so there's a lot of uh, different types of certifications that are out there, CISSP, CSSLP, GIAC, many others. Do you foresee a convergence in the number of these certifications, or are they just going to keep on multiplying? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I, I don't see a convergence. I don't know if they're going to multiply that much more, per se. I mean, they could start to change as we get into different areas, you know. Um, as, you know, let's say mobile comes along and there's certain aspects of that, you know, there could be certifications there. So as the platforms change, I could see certifications changing to uh, match sort of the technology landscape. Um, but I don't necessarily see a lot of convergence. Um, I, to, to be honest, I think the answer to that question is really a monetary question. <laughs> These companies are making money, and uh, as long as they can continue making money, I think we'll still see them there. So, so I'd say that's exactly the problem, is it's really not, you, you know, I don't think there's a really good correlation between those certifications and people who succeed really well in uh, application security work. And I think that's unfortunate. Um, they do, they do seem to bring some people into the field, like they get some base knowledge, but uh, I guess to me they're really sort of irrelevant. So speaking as a CISSP, uh, <laughs> uh, so I, um, I really don't see a point in certs either. Um, I think it would be a great idea if we had some sort of minimum bar, like if you want to be developing code for blah, 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 there's some legislation that says you have to have some credentials to do so. Uh, that of course would stymie tons of really qualified people uh, who just don't want to pay a couple bucks to go get a cert that really doesn't mean anything anyway. Uh, I mean, it's kind of like a college degree in some ways. What does a college degree really tell an employer or what does it prove about you as a person? Um, so I. I think it, I don't think we're going to see any convergence. Uh, I don't really think credentials will start mattering more than they do now unless there's some legislation that forces it to happen. Um, I just think it's going to continue growing at an exponential rate uh, because they figured out it makes a ton of money and people keep paying for it. So said the CSSP. <laughs> I am. <laughs> Which is by far the most popular certification in the industry. <laughs> 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 and the most meaningful too. <laughs> so I, I just want to follow up on that. I think that, I think that uh, application security certifications are really pretty difficult because it's a very broad field and uh, that trying to get a good measurement of somebody's skills on a particular job that they need to do uh, is, is tough because you can't have a certification for like, you know, struts security uh, plus log4j in WebSphere environment on uh, uh, Linux server. Like there, there's too many variables there to, to create a good measuring stick for all the different web environments that we have. OK, great. And then finally, what do you see as the most pressing issue for the security industry in, over the next few years? If you had to guess, what was the top thing that you have to worry about in the next couple of years? Interesting. Um, well, if I could be broad, I mean, and maybe I'm catering to the crowd, I think web AppSec for sure. Um, look, you know, we, you asked the question about cloud computing. It's very clear. All our applications are moving off of our desktop. Uh, you know, everyone's doing online banking. You know, we're doing things that, personally, because I see a lot of threats, really risky things over the web. You know, we, we bank online over the web. We renew certain things over the web. I have all kinds of personal data in some third-party servers that's crossing over the web. Um, so, you know, some people mention things like mobile. Yeah, I think we'll see things there. But really, if, if for example, if mobile wasn't web-enabled, I don't think it'd be that interesting. You know, even when we talk about mobile, I think it's mobile and the web, really. Um, so, I, you know, I, I think it's, it's really going to be web AppSec, to be honest. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. <laughs> How do you? Uh, I always, I, I, when, I, when I think web security, which is really the only thing I know, um, I always think in terms of uh, really large stuff, I, I guess, what was the original question? What's the most pressing, pressing. matter? There's 200 million websites, 10 million more going up each month. We have no idea where they are, who owns them, what they do. We're pretty sure they're riddled with vulnerabilities, but we don't know where they, they, those are either. And if we got over that problem, how do we go about fixing them all? So there's not going to be any one silver bullet answer, but it is a ginormous problem. So there's 
great job security in the industry, but we do definitely do not have the answers to a problem that size. So I don't think this is actually going to happen. Uh, but if I was, you know, could sprinkle some fairy dust on our industry and just sort of make something happen, um, I'd like to see a map of all the major choke points that we've got. So there's in our industry, there's some things like frameworks. That's one choke point. Um, networks, another choke point. Um, browsers, another choke point. These are sort of major things you can change in a couple of spots. Um, you know, a dozen, half dozen uh, browsers, uh, a couple dozen networks across the world. You know, these are major things. You could you could make some changes there, and if you can make some changes in those spots and actually get buy-in from all those people and say, yeah, we'd be willing to, uh, I don't know, shut off people who are sending viruses through our networks. Well, that'd be pretty sweet, wouldn't it? Um, those kinds of choke points, if we can isolate them and just go after them with a few people, not instead of you know millions of people going through every single line of code, with a few people, we can make in extremely large changes um, that actually do affect billions of people uh, on the planet, or billion, I guess, um, on the planet who are using the internet. Um, I, th I personally have focused all of my energy over the last you know, dozen or so years um, on browsers, uh, because it's an area I know. I, I know these guys want to make changes. I know consumers are affected by it. They, they understand browsers kind of conceptually. Um, and uh, it's a place where we can make a lot of difference. But there's other choke points, and we really aren't spending a lot of time focusing on what those choke points are, what the most value for dollars spent are, and what the most difference is uh, based on the amount of time we spend on those issues. Uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the, the strategic view, right? We could do some tactical things right now, and that might be a, viewed as an important thing to do. But I'm going to try and zoom out and look at you know, a long-term strategic thing that's really important for us to try to accomplish. Uh, I think we have to change the way that uh, security is viewed, right? Right now, it's viewed as a sort of an impediment to progress and uh, you know, something that needs to be cost-controlled and put brakes on. I actually don't view security that way. Uh, I view security as an enabler, right? To me, security allows you to do things that you couldn't do without it, right? And there's the, you know, uh, the reason that we have brakes is so that we can drive fast. That kind of analogy is really important. And uh, I think we need to change the way that we talk about security with business to get them to see that, uh, that building security and having the ability to quickly roll out new innovative services in a secure way is a key differentiator for the business. And uh, when we start being viewed as strategic and actually helping, then I think uh, people will respect what we want to do and uh, follow our guidance. But right now, I think we're you know, kind of viewed as the, uh, the police bad guy cop. And I, I think that's really slowing down adoption overall. OK, great. I think we have time for a couple of questions. So. Okay. At what point do you think the companies that write the languages need to secure their language? Did everybody hear that? At what point do, do we have to make the companies writing the, uh, creating the languages create the languages better? So I, you know, this kind of goes back to something I said earlier. And again, maybe on the pessimist, maybe I just see too many attacks and too many volumes all the time. <laughs> You're jaded. But yeah, maybe I'm jaded. You're exactly right. I mean, I've been in this industry too long, but I just. I, I, there's nothing that's 100% secure. So yeah, they could raise the bar, but I think there's just so much, so much unknown that even if it, it's like, it's like you know there's a, a million different potential vulnerabilities. And when we talk about raising the bar and making it secure, we raise it by one notch. There's still you know, 999,000. You know, so I just I don't feel like even with a secure language, um, you could uh, really raise the bar that high and. Just to touch on one other thing, if you look at things like Java, Flash, uh, Android, all these things running in essentially a sandbox, you know, pseudo-secure, quote-unquote, secure languages, uh, the languages are secure so that uh, maybe you don't have particular buffer overflow vulnerabilities. But I could still write a piece of malicious code, social engineer you to run it, and take all your credit card numbers, no matter how secure the language is. So I, I don't know if it necessarily helps that much. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, all the modern languages are really just uh, a little bit of framework around invoking methods in libraries, right? It's not, it, it, I don't think it's a language problem, right? I mean, all the, the languages that we have today are Turing complete, and I, I think trying to limit them in a way that uh, 
you, you couldn't, a, a developer couldn't implement whatever they wanted to would be impossible. So uh, I guess I think it's really not the language problem at this point. I think it's, uh, it, it's higher level issues. I mean, if you look at all the major programming languages that have come out over the last you know dozen or so years, uh, it's not like they're getting like a lot more secure. The closest I've seen, the major leap forward was really Java. Um, the whole sandboxing concept was pretty was pretty amazing, um, but it really still didn't stop all the attacks that we worry about. Um, uh, what happens is was there was a shift, um, but when you're talking about websites, the major shift was one that didn't really affect websites to begin with, which was buffer overflows. We don't really have a lot of buffer overflows in websites occasionally, but it really doesn't happen enough to really worry about. It's not the top ten, let's put it that way. Um, it, was. it was, but it's not. <laughs> in reality, it just doesn't happen that often. Um, I don't really think that a secure language really means anything unless you're talking about uh, something like, here's a widget, boom, there's authentication. You don't ever have to think about it. It magically works. It does all the stuff in the back end, all the anti-brute force stuff, anti-automation, all that goes away, cross request forgery, cross site scripting, state management, done. Uh, that would be a pretty amazing language if it did all that. And by the way, it looks perfect and anti-phishing anti, anti -phishing stuff built into it and logging infrastructure and blah, 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 blah. Um, I don't think that's a language. That's just, framework. That's just a framework. Um, I don't think there's a way to do anything major in a language that wouldn't so be so limiting that you wouldn't just hate it, you know, to throw it away. <laughs> Maybe to pile on just momentarily. <laughs> <laughs> um, most of the ways that we're breaking into websites are language agnostic. You know, that's, you know, there's only a few ways that are, the languages can really do anything about CSRF, language agnostic, cross-site scripting, language agnostic, they're all language agnostic attacks. So, um, you know, they could do better, but it's not going to be like the deciding factor. Uh, the, uh, we, our last statistics reports, we did look at websites and written in different languages and how they performed. They're all suffering the exact same issues, but to a varying degree, and that degree wasn't much. <laughs> so. Yeah, I would, I would say in a vast majority of pen tests we do, we don't even ask the client what they wrote it in because it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. Uh, the only minor differences, stuff like, um, you know, there's a, occasionally a different type of issue, like parameter pollution is only affects certain, and you know, minor, minor differences. But you're talking about like one or two vulnerabilities out of thousands that you need to go check for. Um, so for the most part, it, languages really just kind of don't play much of a role. Okay, uh, last question. Our snake alluded to this before mentioned that there were state-sponsored uh, control of certain corporations' botnets. I'm particularly interested in APTs, so have you seen APTs, and do you think that's a big coming threat? Have we seen a, a specifically state-sponsored, or no, just in general? General APTs, which would apply if there any sophisticated attack and a group behind it, an organized group. Yeah, we get attacked all day long. Um, we get attacked by competitors. We get attacked by. I know. Uh, I. Would you define APT? Yeah, you probably should probably def get more specific when you say APT. Advanced persistent attack. So it's something very low level reconnaissance that you probably didn't detect. Yeah, all day. <laughs> very sophisticated attack that normally succeeds. Why would it have to succeed to be APT? So if you're talking about, um, yeah, yes, we see that kind of stuff all the time. Um, like I said, sometimes it's our competitors trying to break into us, and they're very, very, very persistent. They really want to get in. Sometimes it's, uh, it's coming from overseas. We don't know if it's a, you know, a state, state sponsor or not, but it's certainly extreme, launching new attacks that have never been seen anywhere else before. And it doesn't work on our systems, but they didn't know that ahead of time. They, there's no way they could possibly know that. Uh, I would say it's, it probably happens about once or twice a day. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, I'm not crazy about the term APT. Yeah. Like I, I think the point is right, that you really do need to be a little more specific. But there are clearly skilled attackers out there. And frankly, you don't have to be very advanced in order to break into most stuff. So I, and the term doesn't really work for me. Well, just you know, the reason I wanted, well, wanted you to define it a little bit is because if it's if it's all the time and they're rather advanced, I would count every major botnet outbreak as one of them. You know, from Zeus to everything else that's advanced.